Welcome uh, to the Covington Optimist Club. My, my name is John Mendelton. I'm past president of the club. We meet here at Pee Wee's every Wednesday at 12 noon. Pee Wee's is at 2325 Anderson Road in Crescent Springs. Uh, for uh, our uh, TBNK viewers, today is the 28th of June. Um, today's presentation is videotaped and rebroadcast on Spectrum Channel 203, uh, Cincinnati Bell, now Alt Fiber, for those that are in the know, Channel 815 on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Uh, thank you, uh, Telecommunications Board of Northern Kentucky, um, uh, for being here and taping our programs. Um, you can also stay connected on tbnk to go on demand, uh, TBNK Facebook, and also, of course, our Optimist Club Facebook um, page. Uh, special thanks to uh, Program Director Jason Dudas, who is not only the Program Director, but our cameraman extraordinaire for today, who helps make these programs uh, possible. We are very pleased today to continue our speaker series. Um, we had an award-winning um, uh, speaker series for our candidates um, from the primary election. Stay tuned for those candidate speaker series in the fall. But um, we want to continue our excellent um, group of speakers, and we really have a, a really an award-winning speaker here today, too. Dave Hatter uh, wears many hats. He's an accomplished and enthusiastic and award-winning technology professional and servant leader with more than 30 years of software development, cybersecurity, and project manager. He's an author um, and has been quoted in a number of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine, um, and this one is interesting, MSNBC. I would not think MSNBC and Dave Hatter would go together, but uh, there they are. Um, I'll the take all the free press I can get. Computer World, um, Cyber World, and just to mention a few. He's also a radio personality. You may hear him on Tech Fridays weekly at 6.30 a.m. on 55KRC with Brian Thomas, WLW, uh, Gary Jeff Walker, Nightcap, and he's also a uh, frequent contributor on TV as well, um, on uh, Fox 19 and Local 12. He also believes in community service, having served as mayor, uh, or having served, currently serving as mayor of the city of Fort Wright, um, has served in that capacity since 2015, prior to serving eight terms on the Fort Wright City Council. Um, Dave is a graduate of uh, Leadership Cincinnati, Leadership Kentucky, Leadership Northern Kentucky, and was named the Kentucky League of Cities 2020 elected official of the year. Um, he also was the 2006 NKU College of Informatics Outstanding Alumnus and um, earned the 20, uh, Circuits 2021 Community Award. Uh, he's a graduate, proud graduate of Northern Kentucky University, so um, how about that, Dave Hatter? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, do you want me to start? Are we going to wait? Yeah, we'll, we'll take a break. Uh, all right. Take a break. Right. Well, thank you all for having me. We'll get down here soon. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me today. I got a lot of material to cover, a lot more than we'll fit in this time frame, but I'll be happy to give you the slide deck. So I'm gonna go through it as fast as I can to try to hit all the most salient points. So again, I'm probably gonna skip over a few things. Kind of today, I'm gonna talk about where are we, how do we get here, what are the common threats you're likely to run into, and then really, what can you do about it to protect yourself, your family, and your organization? Uh, this is what I'm hoping to do today, is educate you, motivate you, provide some concrete, actionable advice, and hopefully have a little fun along the way. Uh, this is kind of kind of where we're at now in the world. Um, if you don't pay attention to this stuff, you know, I'm in the business, so I do all the time. We're increasingly in a place where everything is digital. Who doesn't spend more time online shopping, working, whatever today than they did five years ago? I don't see any hands going, right? Everybody is online all the time. And as a result of all of this technology, we're increasingly reliant on it. And this is, this is sort of my take. I agree with this guy. His name is Mikko Hyponen. He's a well-known international cybersecurity guy. Does a lot of talks about this stuff. We're no longer securing computers. We're securing society, right? The water system, electricity, everything depends on technology now. So even though you may say, and I hear this all the time, well, I'm a small <coughs> business or I'm just one person. I, you know, I don't have anything to hide. I don't have anything to lose. I don't care about this stuff. Why is it important? Well, because you might be the entry point into some other system that brings the whole friggin' thing down. Okay? <laughs> so I'm mean, seriously, that's kind of where we're at, unfortunately. And to some extent, that's because all of the technology that makes all of this stuff work was designed in the late 60s and early 70s when no one could envision how it would be used. It doesn't have security built into it by design. You've got to kind of retrofit this stuff in. And consequently, it makes it easy for the bad guys. Now, I'm not going to read all these headlines to you, 
but before I have one of these talks, I always just like to point out, you don't have to look too far, whether it's technology sources or business sources, to find all kinds of real world examples of actual crime, fraud, and impact in the real world from this stuff. So here you go, Cybersecurity Magazine, Cybercrime to Cost the World $8 trillion Annually in 2023. Now, obviously, that's just speculation. No one knows, and you're going to see all kinds of different stats from different organizations and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, bad people are making lots of money, and as society increasingly depends on this stuff, especially in the West, it's more and more problematic. Uh, and then the last few headlines here. Uh, recently from Reuters, Americans should prepare for cyber sabotage from Chinese hackers. Again, getting back to this idea of the physical world dependent on this stuff. Uh, here's, a, here's a hot one for you. So the Internet of Things, and I'll talk about it briefly, smart devices, your smart coffee maker, your ring doorbell, all that sort of stuff. Most of these things are just giant privacy and security dumpster fires. How many smart devices do you think I have? If your answer is zero, you are correct. Zero. Um, Schneider power meter vulnerable opens the door to power outages. So now, again, some of these things, unfortunately, are out of our control. You know, you can't decide what kind of power meter Duke is going to put on your house. But as everything becomes increasingly digital, full of software, it just creates that many more attack vectors for the bad guys. Thankfully, this is starting to get attention all around, you know, in government agencies and so forth. Here's a, a memo from the White House about this. You've got DHS, FBI, CISA, and every sort of government agency out there warning about this stuff now and trying to put out information to help people defend themselves. This is from, these are statistics from the FBI. The FBI has a website called the Internet Crime Complaint Center. It's not only full of a lot of useful tips, but you can also go there and report any sort of fraud that you think you might be a victim of. I've got links to all this stuff at the end too, by the way, but Internet Crime Complaint Center. These are statistics from the FBI through the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Now, obviously some of this is, you know, projections into the future, but my point is even if you don't look at the specific numbers, any type of chart you look at related to cybercrime generally shows a hockey stick-like spike upwards, right? The stuff is not going away for a variety of reasons, which I'll get to here in a second. This is information from Coalition, an actual insurance company that writes cyber insurance policies. So it's one thing for me to speculate or if you to read all these projections and so forth. These are, you know, the things that an actual insurance company that's getting claims are seeing out there in the field. And it's a lot of the same stuff, right? Ransomware, email compromise and fund transfer fraud, usually related. I'm going to talk about those in detail here in a second. But the stuff is not going away. It's getting worse. Bad guys are making lots of money. And the costs are going up. So Chubb, another insurance company, large insurance company, average cost for an incident re uh, response, right, to get nerds like me involved and try to figure out what happened. Because it's one thing to have an incident. It's another thing to figure out what caused it so that you don't have another one, right? Because in many cases, if you get breached, they'll sell your information to someone else, and they'll come right in and steal your stuff, give you ransomware as well. $420,000. So... Why is all this happening now? Well, I've already touched on one of the fundamental drivers, which is digital transformation, which was spurred on to a large extent from the pandemic, right? A lot of people had to work remotely. You've got more people spending more time online since then. And then you have all of these other technologies that make this possible, right? You've got things like um, cloud-based services. In the old days, if you wanted to set up a server farm to launch these sort of attacks, you'd have to spend your own money or take someone else's over. Now you can go somewhere and literally have 30 days of free service, use their resources, launch your attack, shut it down, move it somewhere else. So you're, there's no capital investment whatsoever, and it makes it easy to cover your tracks. You've got things like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Monero, things like that that make it easy for them to get paid more quickly. Um, and in fact, I, people will tell me this sounds unbelievable, but it's a real thing. Some of these organizations out there, truly criminal gangs that are doing this sort of thing, have actual help desks set up. So you get ransomware and it says pay in Bitcoin, right? And you're like, well, I don't know how to get Bitcoin. You can call a phone number and they will tell you how to get Bitcoin. It's a real thing. Don't take my word for it. Look it up for yourself. That's how much money they're making. And most of this stuff is coming from offshore in places where the government's there at best turned a blind eye to it or at worst are complicit in it. North Korea makes billions of dollars a year to fund their government through cyber theft. And again, don't take my word for it, this is coming straight from the government, our government. Um, a couple other things driving it. I've already sort of talked about digital transformation. These comics are kind of funny. They're like, working from home today, no pants. Right? <laughs> as long as I just show you from here up, it's all good. Uh, I already touched on this too. I mean, they're making gigantic amounts of money. You're going to see all kinds of statistics on this. You saw that story um, from Cybersecurity Magazine. They anticipate $8 trillion. They're saying by 2025 it'll be $10 trillion. Enormous amounts of money are being made by the bad guys.
And in most cases, there's nothing being done about it because there's no way to get to them, right? They're offshore somewhere. So, you know, they, it's easy for them. You've got different motivations for this, right? In most cases, it's money. In some cases, it's they want to steal state secrets or they want to steal trade secrets, right? China is well known for breaking into companies to steal their trade secrets. And then suddenly, you know, they're in business with you because you've done all the R&D. So you've got a lot of different angles for why they're coming after this stuff. So again, when you say, I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to value, you, your organization does, and it's used in a variety of different ways. Again, this kind of speaks to the whole idea of digital transformation and how much time people are spending online. Every year, this chart gets updated. I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of stuff, right? And your, all of your devices, your car, your refrigerator, it's all tracking you, it's all collecting data, it's all going out there, and it can all be used against you and other people for a variety of nefarious purposes which gets to my surveillance capitalism. If you've never heard this term, it really adequately describes the world that we're in now. Believe it or not, believe it or not, I spent 25 years as a software engineer. Believe it or not, people don't write software for you just because they're nice people. They like to eat, they like to pay their house payments and so forth. They actually want to get paid. So when you use Facebook or whatever, whatever it is, it's free or low cost, it's not free, you're paying with your data, right? You are the product, not the customer, you're paying with your data. So you've got all this data that's being collected about you. And again, people say, well, I got nothing to hide. Why do I care about that? And again, I'm all going to come back to this in a minute. Internet of Things, so-called smart devices, sucking up all of this data that's all part of this sort of surveillance capitalism model we're in now. So here's an example from Experian, which is funny since, of course, they're one of the larger data breaches out there. Not a fan of Experian. <laughs> But uh, they're showing you here what your data is worth on the dark web, not your company's data, just you as an individual. So again, when you say you have nothing worth stealing, they want your data because they'll either use it to impersonate you for some sort of direct fraud, or they'll use it to impersonate you for some sort of indirect fraud. Like for example, if I can take over your Facebook account, then for at least a short period of time, people will assume anything I'm doing is you, right? So I have Taylor Swift tickets for sale, special deal, 2,500 bucks, get me 2,500 bucks in gift cards. Right? By the time you figure out, you give me the 2,500 bucks, I'm long gone. So again, when people say there's, they're not out to get you, they are. Just because you're paranoid does not mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> they are. So, and then finally, people just keep doing dumb stuff. Right? Despite people like me screaming about this all the time and trying to have opportunities like this to talk about it, which I appreciate, I'm glad TBNK's here, people just keep making basic mistakes that are easily correctable. So let's take a look at some of that real quick. And ideally, if you just do these three things, with anything you do online, you'll be way better off. Stop, think about what you're doing. Does it seem right? Does it seem normal? Is it something unusual? And err on the side of protection. In the business, we nerds like to call it go out of band. I'll come back and talk about that in more detail here in a second. Uh, and I apologize for the setup. The cable is not really long enough for me to get too far away from this computer. Poor credential management, AKA bad passwords. Now I know everyone in here has at least a 30 character unique password on all their accounts, right? <laughs> everyone shake your head, yes, of course you're doing it. I know that already, right? So you don't have to tell me. People keep doing things like what you see here. So when you have a password like admin and the user count is admin, you might as well just take your lock off the door and just stick a Cheeto in the hole, right? So when I accidentally <laughs> bump into your door, I just fall right in. You're making it easy for the bad guys. They know this. Every year studies are done, and every year they come out with a list of the 100 worst passwords, and year after year after year, it's the same stuff, right? People keep doing this. If you're doing this kind of thing, you're making it easy for them to steal your data and ultimately your money, and potentially shut down the whole grid, depending on what you might have access to. Unpatched software, your phone, your computer, your car, everything has software in it now, right? Everything is basically software defined. If you're not installing the software updates from the vendors, or worse yet, another one of the reasons why I despise these smart devices. How many people here replace their coffee maker every year? I don't see any hands going. But you use it till it breaks, right? So when you go out and you get your fancy new smart coffee maker, because it can send you a text and tell you that your espresso is a perfect 104 degrees, right? How long do you think the vendor is going to provide software updates for that thing? Not very long. In fact, they just recently did a study for smart TVs. Most of them stop software updates after two years. So after two years, your TV basically becomes an entryway for every bad person into everything else that you're, is connected in your house. So you have to install software updates. It's absolutely critical. Now, I'm not going to dig too deep into this, but just a couple of charts here. Again, notice the hockey stick. Thankfully, there are lots of people out there trying to get in front of these problems, report software vulnerabilities, and that sort of thing to the people that make this stuff. 
Notice the hockey stick like trend upward of vulnerabilities announced per year, right? So these are flaws in software of all kinds. It's not specific to any particular vendor or anything, but rapidly increasing. Now that's partially because there's more software, right? There's more things that have software. So of course there's more vulnerabilities, but you see this trend. Here's the more disturbing chart, severity distribution, right? So it's not just there are more vulnerabilities, they're getting more severe, meaning more opportunity for the bad guys to do bad things. Spoofing, in my opinion, this is the single biggest problem that makes it easy for people to pull these scams off, okay? Anything can be spoofed. A text, a phone number, an email address, an entire website, um, something that gets posted in Google search engine. It takes almost no skill for me to send a phone call to you that looks like a king. Who here has gotten a phone call from their own number? Yeah, I, I have several times. I don't know who thinks I'm going to answer a call from me to me. <laughs> but, you know, but my, my point, though, is it's very, very easy to spoof a phone number or text or really anything electronic, unfortunately, and that drives a lot of these sorts of scams. And now, thanks to artificial intelligence, things like ChatGPT and MidJourney, it's never been easier to spoof something. So let's uh, talk a little bit about phishing, right? Most of you, I'm sure, have heard of phishing which is usually driven by some sort of spoofing, right? You get an email, it looks like it came from someone you know or some sort of legitimate account, the content in it looks legitimate because they've copied stuff off like a legitimate website. Excuse me, there are different types of phishing. Like sometimes it's just, I'm gonna just blast some stuff out and see what happens. Sometimes it's targeting you or executives in your organization or something like that, right? So when you hear these different terms, spear phishing, whaling, uh, that's just how targeted is it? Vishing is uh, voice, voice phishing, and smishing is text phishing, right? Again, it's very easy to spoof a phone number. It's very easy to send a text, and I'm guessing some of you have probably gotten illegitimate text. My wife almost got sucked into a scam like this. We use USAA. She got a text, said there was fraud on our account, so she calls the number, which all totally fraudulent, by the way, and then they start asking questions like, well, I'm gonna need your account now. Now, why in the world would your bank need your account number? Right, so thankfully at that point, she's like, something's not right about this and hung up and called USAA. So again, healthy dose of skepticism will go a long way. Here's some examples of phishing. So uh, here's an example that went out to our public works director and claims to be for me. Now that's obviously a Gmail account. So again, if you're paying attention and you're skeptical, you'll, you're gonna see a lot of these things. And of course, the old gift card request. Yeah, I need him to go get some gift cards for the council meeting. Yeah. I mean, come on, man, really? So fortunately, and you know, signature block is wrong, email address is wrong, there's a lot of tells in this thing. But that's an example of a phishing attack that wasn't very good. This one's a little better, right? So this one also came to my Fort Wright email account. Now you can see it came from some bogus Yahoo's mail. But here's just, hi Dave, I think you may have sent this link to me in error. Are you really sure you want to be sharing these kinds of personal photos with everyone? Right? So again, they're trying to catch you off guard. They're trying to make you think, oh my God, what could this be? I better go look at this. And notice when I mouse over the link, Flickr, by the way, is a real photo sharing website. It's a legitimate website. Again, this is spoofing. To the naked eye, this looks legit to someone that doesn't understand how this works. When I mouse over it, it conveniently goes to cardpayments.microransom.us. That sounds legit, right? <laughs> uh, right? And I'm sure they would want me to log in at that point, and then, you know, who knows what comes after that. It could be ransomware, it could be anything. But here's a perfect example of something where they're trying to, you know, prey on your emotions, catch you off guard, and get you to do something you shouldn't do. Uh, here's another one. Came to my Fort Wright account. Uh, in this case, it's supposedly a holiday gift card. Now, again, the organization is small enough that, of course, I know everyone that works there. I know this isn't a real person to begin with. But this also goes to cardpayments.microransom.com when you mouse over the warm wishes that this fine person has sent me for the holidays. This one's the funny one, right? So here's an example. This also came to my Fort Wright account. Now, if you know me, you would realize I might have received this email while we're talking, okay? It says, my name is Keith Booth. I'm a senior partner at some law firm. Your spouse has contacted me to prepare the divorce papers. Here's the first draft. Click here. Now, again, if you know me, you'd realize this could, like, I might have this email waiting for me when we're done here. <laughs> uh, but you can see, when you mouse over it, it just goes to some mumbo jumbo out there. But, you know, all of these, you know, they get better. Now, here's the, here's the real money shot, though. This came to my, uh, my email account from our city clerk. So someone spoofed her with an email that looks like it came from me, wanted to know, I know that's hard to read, how much money is in our checking account? So she replies and says, oh, there's four million two hundred and something thousand dollars in there. So now of course they got, I got a live one, I got a live one now, right? 
So then they say, uh, hey, I'm going to need you to do a wire transfer. I need an international wire transfer, and I need a, a domestic wire transfer. And thankfully, she's like, what? That doesn't seem right. So she stopped, right? Skepticism. She picked up the phone, went out of band, and called me and said, hey, Dave, what, what's up with this wire transfer thing? Because, you know, we don't do wire transfers, certainly not international wire transfer. <laughs> At which point, you know, disaster was averted, thankfully. So, you know, again, if you think this isn't going to happen, business email compromise. The FBI claims this is $43 billion over the past five years. That's the kind of scam you just saw there. Either A, they'll, you know, do some sort of phishing attack like that, or B, because you have bad passwords and don't use multi-factor authentication, I get in your email, and then I send out things like fraudulent invoices. They use your real invoice, but change the payment information. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, we just recently had a company referred to us, they lost $983,000 because the bad guys were able to get into the email, lurk around in there, find examples of people that had been invoiced, legitimate invoices to, this, to the victim's customers, and then sent fraudulent invoices to them with different payment information. By the time they figured this out, money's long gone. It's overseas somewhere, there's no recourse for it. Business email compromise, huge problem. Malware, still a problem. Malware, viruses, worms, key, keystroke loggers. A keystroke logger is a piece of software that would get installed on your computer or phone and then silently sits there and just captures everything you type in, which of course is all of your usernames and passwords. Right? So again, th there's some really nefarious stuff out there and then ransomware is still the big thing. So this is also from the FBI and also understand not all crime is reported. So whatever they're reporting is only what they know. I can tell you these numbers are way less than, you know, I can tell you this recent business email compromise thing was not reported to the FBI. So you see, again, hockey stick-like chart upwards in terms of malware, primarily ransomware. I already touched on this. So ransomware, in layman's terms, is software that gets on your devices. It encrypts the data, scrambles it so you can't use it. And they say, hey, now, if you'd like to be able to use these devices, recover your data, et cetera, you got to pay a ransom. And then they got wise to the fact that people like me are saying, well, A, don't pay the ransom because there's no guarantee you'll get your data back. And B, if you have a good backup strategy, you can just wipe everything out, put your data back, and go on your merry way. So then they said, okay, that's fine. While we're encrypting your data, we'll just go ahead and steal it all, and then when you don't pay, I had a news story in those earlier articles there that basically says, okay, if you don't pay, then we'll just go ahead and start to expose your data on the internet. There's a school system in LA that got hit with this, and they released the mental health records of students at this school. Oh. How would you like to have your kids' mental health records basically permanently emblazoned across the internet? That, that's the sort of people you're dealing with here. So again, when you say they're not out to get you, yes, they are. And they will do anything they can to get your money. Public Wi-Fi. I don't ever use public Wi-Fi, ever. Because there are devices like a thing called a pineapple, where I could literally sit out in Pee Wee's parking lot, set up my pineapple so it looks just like his Wi-Fi, but you're not connected to Pee Wee's Wi-Fi. You're connected to my device, and I'm stealing all your stuff. I don't ever use public Wi-Fi, ever, period, ever. I don't use it in a hotel, I don't use it at McDonald's, Panera, I don't use it. If I need to get on the internet, then I will use the hotspot in my Verizon phone and connect my computer to that. If you are going to use public Wi-Fi, again, I'm telling you, I would not do it if I were you, do not do it without a VPN, but we'll come back to that. Free software. This is a chart that shows, from one study that was done of free Android apps through their Play Store, all the problems that they found in these things, right? Top free games, 96% of them had some kind of problem. Here's the good ones. Banking. 88% of free banking apps had some kind of flaw, right? People are just downloading stuff. Hey, Candy Crush, just, just plug that stuff in. I'll go back to what I said before. Believe it or not, software engineers don't work for free. They're not out there just coding away in their mom's basement drinking Mountain Dew because <laughs> they care about your best interest. It ain't happening, okay? So if you're not paying up front, you're paying with your data. I'm not saying there is no free app that you shouldn't use. I'm saying you have to be very careful about this sort of stuff. Social media kind of speaks for itself. Yes, I use some social media. Yes, it has some value. But understand, it's an easy way for criminals to get to you. And it also makes it easy if you put a lot of information out there about yourself for them to know how to impersonate you, for them to find chinks in your armor. For example, if you have a, you know, who here has not had to reset a password where it's like, well, what was your mother's maiden name, right? You set up those security questions in the beginning. If you have all that stuff out on Facebook, I can spend a little time and know how to answer all your questions. So again, it's, it's being skeptical. It's understanding that the more you put out there, the easier it is for them to, uh, to get at you. 
This is the clincher, though, here for me. The Internet of Things, right? Smart devices. Again, coffee maker, ring doorbell, whatever. If you haven't seen, Amazon was recently fined almost $31 million because of issues with Alexa. I have no smart speakers. I don't use any of that crap. And their ring doorbell, which, by the way, if you have a ring doorbell, it can hear you from 25 feet away. You may not know that, but it can. So you might want to look into that. This cartoon pretty much sums it up, though. It's probably hard to read from back there, but again, kind of going back to this, we're now dependent on all this stuff. Here's the thermostat. I'm turning off the heat till you warm up my bank account. Or hungry, pay up and I'll unlock my door, says the refrigerator. Uh, the Roomba here, sweeper, wire my hacker $100 or I'll reverse my motor and blow dirt all over this place. <laughs> now, again, these, so that's kind of funny, but I think just let this one stew when I go to my next slide here. There's your fire, or your smoke detector. 30 bucks in Bitcoin to the next time I smell smoke, I might just let you sleep. Oh. That's where we're at, people. Also on the smart devices, casino, five million bucks down the hole because they set up smart devices to monitor their aquariums, which were broken into because they were misconfigured. But this is me right here. And this is what I would encourage you to go by. I wish I would have thought of this myself. Tech enthusiasts, my entire house is smart. Tech workers, the only piece of technology in my house is a printer and I keep a gun next to it so I can shoot it if it makes a noise I don't recognize. <laughs> so. So all right, what do you do about all this stuff, right? I mean, I could spend the whole day talking about the threats and what to do about it, but I'm just going to try to touch on some concrete things you can walk away from here with and be a lot better off than most people. Because, you know, guys like me are saying you've got to do all this stuff, and then unfortunately, you know, a person still clicks on the link that says here's your divorce papers, and the arrow, boom, right through the, right through the visor. So, and we can't, this doesn't really work now either, right? It's pretty much impossible to get off the grid at this point. If you want to live in modern society, you have to avail yourself to a certain amount of this stuff, right? So you can't just turn everything off. But the good news is there are some concrete things you can do, and you don't need to be scared. You just need to be prepared, because if you make yourself a more difficult target, in most cases, they're just going to move on, right? If you make yourself a more difficult target, they're not, unless you have something of value they know about, they're just going to move on to a softer target. So the first thing, and I know everyone just rolls their eyes when I say this, but you've got to have a strong, unique password for every account. You cannot use the same password across multiple accounts because whether they can guess it, whether they can crack it, or whether they steal it from some data breach somewhere like Experian or something, if you have the same password on multiple accounts, well, now I've got all your accounts, right? So the good news is there are some simple tips, like use a phrase. Come up with a phrase that you can remember. You, know, you still need a unique one for every account, right? I have an example here. But ideally, you just get a password manager, right? We use one password at Intrust. I use one password personally. It uses a variety of encryption techniques and so forth. Because people are like, well, what happens if they crack your password manager? Well, if you use a strong, unique password like that on your password manager, and you turn on multi-factor authentication, it will make it easy for you to create very strong, pretty much uncrackable passwords. I don't know what any password is that I have. They're all just some random series of numbers and letters except for the master password to my password manager. My Facebook password, LinkedIn password, bank account password, they're all like literally 80 characters of mumbo jumbo. It literally is uncrackable with modern technology. I only need to know the one password, the password for the master, for the pa the master password for the password manager, and then you turn on multi-factor authentication, which I'll get to here in a second, and now you are going to be very, very difficult to hack. Now, if your master password is bad, Right? And you don't turn on multi-factor authentication, well then you're like the Cheeto guy there again, right? In the lot. You're making it easy for him. So I recommend you use a password manager. There are plenty of excellent ones out there. Again, I use one password personally. Um, they are, in many cases, low cost. You're talking maybe four or five bucks a month. They'll have family plans, so you can get your whole family using the thing. You'll be much better off. And it will actually make your life less difficult because once you kind of get in the hang of using it, the password manager works for my computer, it works for my phone, it works for my tablet. Wherever I am, I have all my passwords all the time. Right? Oh, I only need to know that one master password. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Because if you just did this one thing, you would be vastly more secure than most people. So next couple of things here. Multi-factor authentication, MFA, two-step verification, two-step authentication, and unfortunately it's called different things. I'm sure every one of you has experienced this probably with your bank. You go to log in, it wants to send you a text or something, right? Turn that on everywhere you can. Every account you have, turn on multi-factor authentication because then even if they can guess your password, crack your password, steal your password, they still can't get in without that code. It is 
raising the bar significantly. Yes, it can be defeated. Yes, there are ways around it. Yes, there are different ways to do it that are more secure than others. In fact, it's kind of funny. This is called a YubiKey, right? So this is my multi-factor authentication. I don't get text because text can be intercepted. It's easy, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy. It can, it's much easier to defeat than this. If you wanna unlock this computer, you gotta have this key, right? You physically have to have this key, which is funny because occasionally I'll switch cars with my wife and leave without it. <laughs> and then I show up somewhere to do something like this and can't unlock the computer. It has happened on occasion. So, you know, this is the most extreme way to go about it. The best way to go about it for most people is to use an authenticator app. Google makes one, Microsoft makes one. It's software you install on your phone. You synchronize it up with your accounts and then the code comes to that app. If you can intercept my text, right? Well, there are many different ways to do that. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, got simjacked and they were broke into his Twitter account because they could get his text. <clears throat> With an app, right, now you have to have my phone. You have to be able to unlock my phone because of course I have a strong password on the phone just like all of you do, right? right? And you have to have the app synchronized up so you physically have to have my phone. Or in most cases, I'm using this thing now to take it a step even further. But multi-factor authentication, turn it on everywhere you can. Microsoft and Google have both said independent of each other, it'll block 99% of all of these automated attacks. It's not perfect, they're figuring out ways to get around it. I don't believe the 99% number, by the way. But I can tell you, it'll probably block 80 plus percent. Coupled with a strong, unique password, you're gonna be very difficult to hack. Software updates, okay, so so far, Strong unique password costs nothing. Maybe a little time, a little friction. The MFA costs nothing, right? Just gotta turn it on, get in the habit of doing it. Software updates cost you nothing. So the three most important things, and this isn't just my opinion, this is what everyone out there that talks about this will tell you, these are all free. You just have to do it. Now, unfortunately, you can't always set your systems up for automatic updates. Your smart refrigerator, can it be configured to do automatic updates? I don't know, maybe, probably, but you probably gotta get in there and figure that out your smart TV, your smart dryer, whatever. You need to make sure that your phone, your tablet, your PC, anything that has software in it is getting updates from the vendor and you need to install them, generally speaking, as soon as possible. If you just do these three things, you are going to be so much more difficult to hack than the average person. They're just gonna move on to a softer target. And again, all of these basically cost nothing other than a little time, a little friction, and maybe a few bucks a month for a good password manager. Endpoint protection aka antivirus that's what it was called back in the old days right you need to have some kind of endpoint protection slash <clears throat> antivirus on any device that you can put it on your ring doorbell doesn't support this kind of thing but your phone your your tablet your pc you need to have some type of endpoint protection windows comes with windows defender gartner is an industry think tank group they rate this sort of stuff you can see they're putting microsoft near the top of the pile it's free it's baked in you just got to make sure it's turned on and it's getting updated so another example of some simple thing you can do that literally costs nothing. Firewall, any device that will support a firewall, which is just software for this context, just software that's trying to keep the bad people out, okay? It's another layer. When you hear people like me talk about this, you'll typically hear layered defense, right? If you get through this thing, then there's another thing back there that's trying to stop the bad guys from getting in. You need a firewall. When this has one built into it, you just need to make sure that it's turned on. Okay, so I mean, if you're not using a Windows device, and I'm going to show you some tips for how to find information about the rest of this stuff, um, it's already built in. So all five of these things so far either are free or you've already paid for if you have Windows. Virtual private network, right? This is basically a way for you to send in data that's encrypted over the internet. If you are going to use public Wi-Fi, I would never do it without a VPN. There are plenty of good VPN software applications out there. Nord is probably the most well-known one. It's like four bucks a month. Okay, it gives you the ability, it, it does a bunch of different things, but basically gives you the ability to encrypt the data as it's being sent across the internet. So if you're gonna use any kind of public Wi-Fi, do not do it without a VPN. I don't do it, period, but don't do it without a VPN. Last few things here, encryption. Windows has built-in encryption capabilities. You just gotta turn it on so that if someone does, for example, steal your computer or you lose it or whatever, Unless you have a bad password and they can unlock it, your data is encrypted. There's nothing they can do with it. You should turn on encryption on your phone. You should use encryption wherever you can to secure your data so that as long as you have a good password, they won't be able to access it. One specific thing I want to talk about briefly, even though I know I'm kind of going over here. For a long, long time, people like me would tell you, okay, if you're buying stuff online, e-commerce, right? Shopping online, Amazon, for example. Look for the lock and or HTTPS. Does this sound familiar to everybody? Yeah. 
Okay, here's the problem with that. You should still do this because the lock is telling you that the information you're exchanging with that website is encrypted, which is good. You always want that. The bad news is bad people know that people like me have said, look for the lock, right? If, if you see the lock, it's secure. So they'll set up a spoofed website. I can go right now to any website you want, copy everything off of it, spin up a free server in Taiwan, put all that stuff on there, register a domain name that's close to it, and then I'll spend the money for the certificate so I get the lock. So when you see it, you see the lock and go, all right, this thing is secure. Dave told me look for the lock. My point being, just because you see the lock, yes, the data is encrypted, but it does not mean the organization that's getting the data is legit. You can't just assume because you see a lock and or HTTPS that you are dealing with a legitimate organization. So, you know, again, it's important. You want to see that, but you can't assume that just because you see that, you're dealing with something legit. Backup. Never been easier or cheaper to back up your data. Backup is the best defense against ransomware. You get ransomware, you wipe the machine, you restore your data. You know, Microsoft, again, with OneDrive, which is free, essentially, is sort of a poor man's backup. It gives you a way to back up your data into their cloud. You can go out to Best Buy and buy a big old external hard disk where you press one button, it backs everything up. It's never been easier or cheaper to back up your data. Now, you know, in a corporate enterprise type setting, there are better ways to do it than what I'm describing here, but just for a regular person, very easy, very inexpensive. Again, we're so far still mostly in the free realm other than the VPN. One of the most important devices in your network at home is your Wi-Fi router, your internet gateway, whatever it's called in your, you know, whether it's Spectrum or Bell or whatever, AltaFiber. AltaFiber, great name for a breakfast bar, right? I don't know what they were thinking when they changed the name of that, but anyhow. You need to make sure that you're updating the software in those devices as well, right? There's software in there that makes that thing work. You've got to update it, and you should turn on the highest level of encryption your particular device supports so that people can't just sit outside and connect up to your network. There's a well-known case where two neighbors didn't like each other. Neighbor A happened to be pretty sophisticated, decided to break into neighbor B's environment, downloaded a bunch of child porn, FBI kicks in his door and hauls him off to jail. Now, they eventually figured this out, but how would you like to have that happen to you? So again, I know this stuff sounds crazy. It's real. Look it up for yourself. Uh, last couple slides here. Don't just download the first free thing you come across. Don't download the great new game someone told you about or whatever. Do your homework. There are plenty of sites, and I have links to them in here. Again, I'll give you this slide deck where you can go online to reputable organizations, ZDNet, CNET, Tom's Guide, PC Magazine, Consumer Reports, where they have editors and experts that test this stuff. When you say, oh, Dave said I need antivirus, right? What's the right antivirus for me? Well, you can go to those sites and they'll say, here's the best antivirus of 2023. Here's the best VPN of 2023. So you don't have to remember all this stuff. You don't have to have a nerdy friend like me to answer these questions. There's tons of information online from reputable sources that can help you make these decisions. Again, I got links here in a second. Secure your bank accounts. You know, turn on whatever sort of fraud protection you can, turn on all the alerts, Turn on everything you can with your bank to make it as difficult as possible for someone to steal your money. And then kind of lastly, there's all kinds of free resources for how to make your systems more difficult to hack, well, be, well deeper than what I've gotten into here. So, you know, again, this is sort of a nice infographic. Again, uh, you can have this slide deck. If you just kind of looked at this, it sort of summarizes everything I've talked about here, right? Don't use public Wi-Fi. Use a security suite, a a.k.a. antivirus, right? Use strong passwords. Enable multi-factor authentication. And then ultimately, unfortunately, the bad guys are constantly changing their tactics. The threat landscape changes. They're smart. They're evil. They're devious and creative. So you kind of have to, if you want to protect yourself, your organization, your family, you got to try to stay out in front of this stuff. As I mentioned before, stop, think, protect. Again, anytime you get something that's unusual, if you know, your bank is calling you and it looks like their number and they're asking for information they should already have, just assume it's a fraud. And I, I want to spend one second on here. Who's heard the term voice cloning? Anybody? Okay, so voice cloning, thanks to AI, and I can actually show you this uh, if we have time later, you can go right now to a free site and in about seven seconds train it on any voice you want. Now, people are like, well, how would that ever happen to me? Who here has voicemail? I see a lot of hands going up. You've got a voicemail with a message with your voice on it, right? So what's going to stop me from calling your voicemail, recording your voice, plugging it into one of these AI tools, and now I'm you, and I can make you say anything I want? I know this sounds like science fiction. Trust me, it's real. I can show it to you today. 
It's very real. It's a thing. Uh, one of the stories I pointed out there before, $35 million was stolen from a bank in the UAE four years ago. So, I mean, this technology has existed for a while, but now it's out in the wild. $35 million stolen, and part of the scam involved a voicemail, supposedly, from one of the bank directors authorizing this transfer. AI is real, deep fakes are real, and this voice cloning thing, my prediction is you're going to see a wave of crime uh, like no one has ever seen before because this is very easy to do. You can't believe your eyes, you can't believe your ears, anything you see can be easily spoofed, and AI, frankly, makes it that much easier. So, stop, think, protect, err on the side of this is probably a scam and I'm going to have to figure out what to do about it. And then security, you got to put that stuff on everything, like the Frank's lady there, right? <laughs> Here's some uh, Twitter accounts that are full of useful information, most of it not very technical, but it would just be helpful for regular people, including my guy Miko from that earlier slide. Uh, here's a bunch of links to stuff I've talked about today. Again, lots of free resources, ZDNet, CNET, editors, experts who rate stuff and tell you, you know, what you need to know. Uh, and then there's my upgraded tinfoil hat. <laughs> they actually made a tinfoil hat for me at the office, but it wasn't blocking enough of the government brainwave, so I, I had to upgrade to this. So I'm happy to answer any questions. There's all my contact information. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Dave. We're going to take a short break for lunch, and we'll be right back with some questions. So audience members, get your questions ready. Welcome back. Thank you, Pee Wees, for a great lunch that was fantastic. Uh, the audience here at Pee Wees, thank you for being here. And uh, the audience who's watching on TVNK, we'd like you guys to come and join us every Wednesday at noon at Pee Wees. So Dave Hatter is here with us, the mayor of Fort Wright and also a tech guru. Super nerd. Super nerd. Something like that. He's got a whole boatload of questions here, so we'll give you about 10 minutes to answer questions, and we'll give you like a minute or two for closing remarks. Okay. All right, so here's a question. So if I have an 80 character password, how does the password manager that I reference tell me? Does it autofill the password or do I have to type it all in? Well, if it's working the way it's supposed to, it will autofill the password. That's one of the benefits, right? You just go to a site, and when you go to log in, it knows your username or password, and assuming you log into the password manager, it takes your 80 character or 130 character or whatever password and just plugs it in. So, I mean, you may have situations where sometimes it won't work right, and you may have to... You want to type it and you can just copy it and paste it from the password manager. But yeah, ideally it automates that whole process. So once you have a strong, unique password on the password manager, you log into it and it just takes care of the rest. And changing your password is easy. I need a new password. I have it automatically generate some new ridiculous random password. It saves it. It's automatically associated with that site. I'm off to the races. Does that answer your question? Yes. Oh yeah, sorry. Here. And it syncs up with those um, the good ones do, yes. I mean, you'll have to look at that and figure out, like, if you have an Android device, is the password manager you're looking at work on Android or Apple or whatever. But, yeah, it, you should be able to install it on all of your devices, and then wherever you're logging in, it's just there. Does that make sense? Are the various Amazon, Apple, and Google smart speakers always on? Can a bad guy access this? Well, think about it for a second. If it wasn't always on, how would it possibly re respond to your request? Right? It has to be listening to you, so when you say, hey Siri, or whatever, it's wake word, hot phrase, whatever they call it is, to engage. So yeah, it's always listening to you. The question is, you know, does it record that? Who has access to that? And I predict for most people, if you look into folks like Amazon, I, I hate Amazon, by the way, um, and that, I slightly less than Google. Google's at the top of the heap, then probably Facebook and Amazon are in a death match for who I loathe the, the next best. Um, but if you think about it for a second, how could it not be listening to you? And then again, the question is, is it being recorded? How long is it stored? Where is it stored? Who has access to that? And I think if you look into those questions, you will not like the answers. So I would not recommend that you have any of those sort of devices. Recommendations for password manager. So I recommend 1Password, but again, you can go to CNET, ZDNet, Tom's Guide, PC Magazine, 
they'll have uh, every year, here's the best password managers of 2023 with their recommendation for why. Usually they'll pick five, their recommendation for why this particular one is the best or that particular one is the best. And they'll usually give you some insight like this is the best for business. This is the best for personal use. This is the best for family use. My advice is, you know, don't just take the advice of any one of them. If you go to ZDNet and they say one password, and you go to CNET and they say one password, and you go to Tom's Guide and they say one password, are they all in the top five? That's probably a pretty good choice because you've got three different organizations picking it, right? And that's the way you can really research any of this stuff. VPN, okay, go to CNET, see what they pick. Go to ZDNet, go to Tom's Guide, go to PC Magazine, and if you can find one that makes the top five across everyone, that's probably gonna be a good fit. Uh, but I use one password personally. My wife unplugged the TV in our bedroom. Should we keep it unplugged? Well, and John and I talked about this briefly. I mean, yeah, probably your IQ will go up substantially if you don't have the TV on in your bedroom just in general. Now, he didn't say power or Internet. I'm assuming he means Internet. You know, keep in mind, if you have a smart TV, right, that's how you get streaming services and all that sort of stuff. If it's connected to the Internet, it could be listening to you. If it has a camera, it could be watching you, depending on how it's configured. But the bigger issue in my mind is just, do you understand how to update the thing? So, you know, it's hard to buy a TV that's not a smart TV nowadays. My advice would generally be, unless you really intend to configure it correctly, which you can get tips online from these places I've talked about, and you understand how to update the software, uh, you're basically at least potentially setting yourself up for problems. Yeah, I'd leave it unplugged. Uh, how much time is it? I'm not reading that. That's John's silly question. <laughs> Uh, based off my story about the FBI. Uh, let's see. If you are just an average citizen, how much does the uh, hurt effect protect you, especially with home devices? Home devices. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it affects you at all. Well, how, or how it helps you at all. How would you, how would you think that would help you? I mean, you're just one out of how many billion people have. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I can go online and rent software that will attack all of you billion people. And for those of you who aren't doing all the stuff I'm telling you here, I'm going to find your weaknesses. I'm going to log that, and then I'm going to come back later and steal your stuff. Does that make sense? This is not someone sitting in their mom's basement thinking, hey, I think I'm going to hack Dave Hatter today. This stuff is all automated, right? There's all these huge data breaches where they see, oh, look, here's Joe Doak's account. And here's a bad password in it. Now I'm going to find Joe Dokes, and I'm going to try his bad password on all his accounts. All this stuff is automated. It's not just some guy in his mom's basement with a Mountain Dew attacking you or attacking you or attacking him. They're just blasting stuff out there to see what they can find. So I would argue very little at best. And then John's, uh, let's see, I've got another one here. Smart meters from Duke Energy uh, controls your usage wherever, when, how, why. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a perfect example of a so-called smart device, right? Now, I don't think really, unless you want to pay a whole lot extra, you have a choice now, except to have a smart meter. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, there's all kinds of technology out there that might potentially let you get off the grid at some point. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I mean, anything that is smart, if it's connected to some network, and it's got software in it, not only can somebody some remotely control it somehow, but it could also be hacked. And you know, a major problem I have with all these smart devices is A, in most cases, the goal is not to protect your privacy and security. It's to be first to market. It's to get the vast, the most market share. It's to collect your data because that's how they sell the stuff to you for next to nothing. And you know, they don't really care about your privacy or security. These things are not designed with privacy and security in mind. So whether it's a smart meter from Duke or whatever else, you know, some of this stuff, it's getting harder and harder to avoid. But to the extent you can, as a consumer, avoid this stuff, you should. Because if you just spend five minutes today online and look for examples of smart devices that have been hacked, you will find very alarming things, trust me. And you'll see people like Amazon getting huge fines for this stuff. There was recently a big scandal because now they're Roomba sweepers, right? Amazon bought Roomba, the robotic sweeper, and they've, they've started a new program where they have cameras and microphones in them. I'm not sure why your sweeper needs that, but they do. And some people signed up to test this, and then suddenly somehow there's people like a woman sitting on her toilet. There's the Roomba, basically like doing an upskirt shot of this chick on the toilet. I'm not making this stuff up. Go see for yourself. So, so when you say, oh, but it's so convenient, it is, but you've got to understand the risks. Now, the argument they make why they have the cameras is, well, you know, and this, this is kind of funny, 
if you, you may know someone this has happened to, you come home from work and your Roomba has smeared dog crap all around the house because the dog went to the bathroom in the house and it doesn't, it's dumb and it just runs through it and smears it all around. Again, you find plenty of videos of this. Mm -hmm. So one of the arguments for why it has a camera is because then it can determine, well, that's actually a big pile of dog crap, not a black sock, and maybe I should not run over that. But it also means the thing can be recording you at any given time. And then what happens to that information? Who knows? So again, yes, I realize I'm a tinfoil hat guy. You already saw the photo. Yeah, you know, and you know, your heart effect thing, I get it, but the more of the stuff you plug in, the more you're setting yourself up for these kind of problems. My advice is just don't, just say no. Take the Nancy Reagan approach, just say no. And then uh, last question, are you ready for Jesus? And I'm gonna say probably not at this point. So, other questions? Yeah, sure. Well, you can pay for services, uh, kind of like, you know, LifeLock and other services like that that will go scan for you. Um, you can use a site like Have I Been Pwned, uh, where you can type in your email address. And this guy works for Microsoft. He gets database, basically plugs a database full of breach information that's out there. And you can see, like, has your email address shown up in a breach? If it has, I mean, there's really nothing you can do about it except change your, I would start changing your passwords if you find out that's the case. Be another reason to have a password manager because it'll make that a lot less difficult. Um, but there are services that will pay to basically kind of actively monitor. Again, LifeLock is probably the most well-known one. I'm sure you've probably heard of them before. Uh, but you can use sites like Have I Been Pwned and just go type in your email address and see what it finds. But uh, trust me, whatever it finds, it's just a tiny, tiny piece of what's out there, you know. So, does that answer your question? It's good as a hell out of it, what it does. Sorry, I, I usually do. Well, close it, yeah. I have one question. Yep. It's actually a statement. I've known you for 30 years. I think I can honestly say I know your password, and you are ready for Jesus. <laughs> well, I guarantee you don't know my password, John. I guarantee that. If you know my password, that would be quite miraculous. I'm just kidding, but I know yeah. you're ready for Jesus. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your time. Hopefully that was helpful. I usually do terrify people. Sorry. That's just the nature of things. But again, a healthy dose of skepticism and stopping and thinking about things will, will save you a lot of trouble. And if you just do the, the four or five simple free things I mentioned, you are going to be vastly better off than most people. So thank you. Thank you.